Welcome into the October 4th episode of the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. The Maple Leafs were victorious again in the preseason. Nick Robertson continued to impress, as did Matt Murray against the Montreal Canadiens. And I've got a lineup projection 1.0 for opening night to unveil. You won't want to miss it. All that more coming up on today's edition of Locked On Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me is my co-host Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. And Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you haven't already, go check us out on YouTube. Uh, go search up Locked On Leafs. Hit subscribe, hit the little notification bell as well, and make sure that you get notifications and notified each and every day when we put an episode out Monday through Friday, all Leafs, all the time. Leafs with a big duck tonight, Dave. Excited? Oh, you beat the Montreal Canadiens. Doesn't matter if it's preseason, regular season. It's basically a Stanley Cup victory. Basically yep. just as satisfying as a round one win. Am I right? Oh, we're gonna bring that. <laughs> How about this new digs? I don't. Am I coming across echoey? I still. So I made the move right over the weekend. Yeah. Still not fully moved in. Like there's clearly some stuff that I got. I got nothing on the walls, and it's pretty bare in here. It, it seems a little echoey because I don't got much in here. To 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 me, it sounds like it. So if it's a little echoey, that's why. Over the next week or so, I'll hopefully get some stuff. I don't even have a chair. Or, dude, like I'm sitting on my bed with a computer and mic on a TV tray because I'm so ill-prepared with this move. I need a desk chair for my desk. So we're going oh, we're gonna, to we're gonna go through. But, yeah, it's a new little setup here. But uh, I don't know why I went on that kind of, t- you know, I, I was going to bring up, like, new season, new digs. Like, this is. Yeah, right? New season, who dis? Right? New place, who dis? I sent that out to uh, on on my IG new place. Who dis? A little Toronto, Ontario on it. Not too bad though. I'm like I don't know about a 15 minute walk or so to uh, Scotia Bank Arena, home of the Maple Leafs. So happy to be back in downtown Toronto. Um, speaking of Toronto, big five uh, five one win over the Habs in preseason action, and I mean. Nick you, Robert, called, you you were close. You said five two. I did say five two. I did. I, I I tried to price is right one up you. Matt Murray's better than I anticipated, right? Matt Murray was just a little bit better than I anticipated. I thought maybe he'd let a second goal. He barely allowed one goal. It was a it was it was on the power play. So far through two games, this guy has yet to allow a goal at five on five. He was 23 of 24 tonight, stopped five of six high danger chances tonight, and had a 139 goal saved above expected Matt Murray is looking pretty good I know it's only preseason and and we do need to kind of temper expectations a little but so far so good on the goalie gamble we like we were as I have been saying all preseason long I'm not going to get too high I'm not going to get too low but this is a good start this is yeah. where you you want to see a foundation being built both Samson and Murray have looked good that's a good thing it's just now all right. When things get harder, is this is this form going to be <laughs> going to be ma- oh you know, something that can maintain? And funny enough, I, I so many people were commenting on, oh, the goggles are amazing, life changing goggles <laughs> with the with Curtis Stanford uh, bringing up on that. Well, them bringing that up was it yesterday that that Mur- Matt Murray brought up? Yeah, using goggles. Yeah. So it's 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 funny, but working wonders already, huh? Oh yeah, and, and like you're watching this, and like you're not nervous, really watching like these guys play. There have been some nervous moments when you watch Leaf goalies play in the past, but I, I I constantly have to also remind myself that this is a new goaltending department. Yeah, it's a totally new approach to the to the way that they play 
I mean, first off, I never once heard about goggles being used. Not with the Leafs. Wasn't a thing with the Leafs. Nope. Steve Breer was not really a big goggles guy. You did use those dummies, like the... Oh, yeah. That would stand and do the shop locking. Yeah. So we've upgraded from that to goggles. Look, I I think that we can only be pleased with what we've seen out of the goaltending, and and Matt Murray was uh, spectacular. Like... The first game, I don't think he was tested a whole lot. Uh, a lot of it was very peripheral. Um, everything was kept to the outside. I think I even remember asking you, what do you think the average shot distance was? And it was like in the 40s. It was just, it was so you know absurdly far. I was like 45 feet or something like that. Tonight, a little closer, 30 feet. The lone goal he allowed was within seven feet. It was on the power play. It was just a little kind of uh, you know skirmish in front of the net, and, and Drew finds a, a loose puck. But... Ultimately, he had to make some pretty good saves. Like that one stop he made on Slavkovsky in the second period, like that was a good stop, right? Going um, east, east, west, and just getting the glove on it. Did a little bit of a flash the leather, put a little bit of extra mustard on that one. I'll say that. But either way, man, I I think he's made some pretty solid stops uh, tonight, and that's all you really want, a Matt Murray. If this is the Matt Murray that you're gonna get throughout the rest of the season. This team's going to do very well. They're going to win a lot of hockey games. Keep in mind, they're a 900 save percentage last year and had 115 points. He doesn't need to be Andre Vasilevsky. But if he could just be league average, which last year was 908, 907, or 908, this team will win a lot of hockey games. Well, that's that's it, right? You know, they don't need they've never needed great goaltending to get through the regular season. Where you're expecting and hoping to get the great goaltending is the postseason, the playoffs, right? Yeah. Which good track record from Matt Murray there, right? Yeah, and I, I think Sam Sonov. You look, if people brought, bring up his stats from his time in Washington. I I don't think Washington was a great has been a great scene for a lot of goaltenders over the past few years. You see some of these guys move on. I think I think a new system. New situation can mean a lot of things for both goaltenders, which is why, yes, I know people weren't exactly thrilled with the moves when they happened, but I'm willing to give it a chance considering you can't say, oh, Matt Murray is washed and finished when he was playing for the Ottawa Senators, who are were not a very good team and were very, very much trying to not be a very good team. They weren't exactly trying to be good, so you can't expect – him to be in in a good spot there and especially with the injuries too so that's the only thing i'm gonna bring up I'm gonna knock on wood because that's the only thing i'm a little concerned about with these guys is health one yeah. thing happens chagrin isn't bad but he's not what you want to you don't want to have to call upon him early on into into the season no you definitely definitely don't want to want to have to do that but like you look at the expected numbers from last year for the for the uh for Toronto Maple Leafs and you filter all strengths right five on five penalty power play penalty kill expected goals against they were third in the in the National Hockey League so you're getting better defensive in front of you for these goaltenders look at Ottawa they were 26th in expected goals against last season so they were you know allowing quite a bit um, so, you know, in front of a better defensive team, you would hope that you get better results, uh, and so far so good on Matt Murray. The other guy who impressed for a second straight game is Nick Robertson, uh, three points, didn't end up with a goal, but did have three assists. And to be honest with you, I think that's actually better for him. The fact that he was able to be so productive without finding the back of the net and still was able to be a standout in this game. For a guy who, you know, I don't think anyone questions his goal scoring ability or his shot, but can he do some other things away from the puck or can he be more of a facilitator at some point and help his line mates create? He showed tonight he can certainly do that. I thought this was maybe his best game I've ever seen in a Maple Leaf uniform. That's and that and that's what I said going into this game. Can he continue to be an offensive threat, not necessarily needing to score? But can he be a consistent offensive threat? And again, we, we were concerned with the Tavares injury because that, you know, you're not thrilled with having to put Kerfoot on that second line. But if you got 
Robertson and Nylander bring in the offensive punch that you need. And Kerfoot could just be that defensive guy. I know some are not exactly high on his defensive ability. That sets up a lot better for you than, you know, having to hope and pray that you can hope that Robertson can perform. Now, this is against the Ottawa Senators and the Montreal Canadiens, who are very much trying to now Ottawa and it's preseason. So they're although Ottawa, I mean, both of these two teams Uh have actually boasted some pretty solid lineups that they've had to go up against. To be fair to, to, to Robertson, it's not like they've been scrub a jellers that they've been going up against. These have been two, two games in a row now where he's impressed um, to back to back three point games where he's been playing against a, a rather large portion of the lineup being NHL quality players. Exactly. And you know, there's going to be consistent doubt with him until he does it, makes this team on a full-time basis. And he knows that. I think confidence for the, for him is at an all time is at a high in terms of his since joining the Leafs, really. And I think that's a good thing for him. But let's see what happens when the puck isn't going into the net for him, where things aren't going right for him. Can he dig himself out of it? Because we've seen him go off, get off on some decent starts, and then things kind of falter a little bit. So I want to see how he handles the ups and the and the downs, because that's. That's going to ultimately test kind of his character and his ability as a as a you know, as a professional NHL player. Absolutely, and uh, Nick Robertson actually, I just realized this, um, tied for first in the preseason with seven points. Um, so I mean, good on Nick Robertson. Currently atop of the leaderboard in the entire NHL in terms of points with seven through uh, three games that he's played. And here's what Sheldon Keefe had to say on Nick Robertson. He said, quote, Nick had another good day. He's playing really good hockey right now. He's doing things he needs to do to show that he's wanting a spot on the team and he's ready to play in the NHL. As he continues to stack these games up, of course, we're paying attention. Yeah, so am I. So are you, Dave. And so is everybody else watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast. We're all seeing the last couple of games that of Nick Robertson and saying he looks like he's ready for the NHL. He definitely put in a solid off season and it wants to be in the NHL. I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, right now he might be the front runner for that top six position on that left side, especially with Tavares out, you know, cause now there's, there's two spots effectively open in the top six with the Tavares injury. You know, you slide Kerfoot into the middle. I think, Robertson could have an opportunity to gain that, uh, you know, that other top six role based on the way that he's playing the last couple of games. I I don't see anybody else really going about like that would be more deserving right now than him. Right. Yeah. Like, that That's the big one. There is not only is he performing well, but he's performing above the guys that he is competing against for that spot. And I think that's, that's good to see for him because that's there were so many question marks about whether or how the lineup is going to shake out, whether he could actually cement a spot for himself. And he's done it to the point where I can't see anyone more deserving than him right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, we'll take a break, but when we get back, I'm actually going to unveil my roster projection 1.0 for opening night. Do I have Nick Robertson in my top six for opening night? Did he crack it over the last couple of games? Well, you'll have to find out next. But first, Dave, how about a word from today's show sponsor? Yep. If you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Ready? Delicious, indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to their new flavor, the cookie dough chunk puffs, which have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks. And of course, they're hot and they're covered in 100% real chocolate, just like all built bars out there. All that joy without the hassle of making it. And they're only a 160 calories and a whopping 15 grams of protein in every bar. So run to built.com to snag a box for you and the family. It'll be the perfect treat. Or really, if you're good at finding hiding places in your house, 
hoard them for yourself because once you get everybody else trying it, not sure they're going to be willing to uh, stop at one. Like old Bill Bar's new cookie dough chunk puff is covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they're healthy and tasty. Chocolate covered cookie dough with a light fluffy texture. Mm, so good. What's great about Bill is all their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. You're going to love the new flavor. Whether you need a snack for your workout, a late night treat, or just need something quick on the go, Built is the perfect protein bar, and they taste better than a candy bar. Just the calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a Built bar. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 today, and get 15% off your order. So that is promo code LOCKED15. Get 50% off your order at Built.com. Welcome back into the Lockdown Lease Podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with my main man, Dave Morissuti. We are hosts here at Locked On Leafs. Uh, Toronto with a 5-1 win over the Montreal Canadiens and moved to, what are they now, 4-1 and one on the preseason, I want to say? Yeah, 4-1 and one on the preseason. Quick five games. Holy cow, they've already played five games. That's the one was the back-to-back on the, on the same day, so it hardly counts. But still, that's that's a lot of games. And through five games, Dave, I'm starting to get some clarity on what I believe the roster will look like come opening night on October 12th. So what I'm going to do right now, Dave, is I'm going to unveil my roster projection 1.0. You let me know how close you think I am and if you have any thoughts on it. You ready to go? Let's do this. All right. So my opening night lineup, I obviously on the top line will be having the trio of Bunting, Matthews, and Mitch Marner. Those guys combined for 61 goals at even strength last year as a trio. And that wasn't even with them playing together the whole year. Matthews missed a bunch of games. Marner was out for some games. And Bunting didn't even play on their line for the first like month. But then once they all got going and once they all ended up kind of really um, finding chemistry with each other, one of the top lines in hockey. I see no reason whatsoever why you would break them up. Um, so that's clearly going to be my top line come opening night and they were uh, you know solid again tonight for the first time being put together against the Habs the second line is where things get a little bit more interesting I think we could all say um I've got Kerfoot centering the line uh with John Tavares's absence he will not be ready to go by the opening of uh, the season he'll miss the first week at least potentially more um we'll see what ends up happening with him but with him not going to be there for the first four games i got kerfoot as a second line center with nylander and i do have nick robertson winning that job i think the last couple of games uh really has given the coaching staff um you know some some uh, what's the word i'm looking for um you know they like what they saw and it's allowed them to believe in this kid. It's given them some belief in Nick Robertson that he can actually, uh, he is ready for the NHL. So I think that ultimately he will end up being the guy, like the only other player I can think of at this point who would potentially take that role would be either Cali Yarncroke, if they're going to try and put him in, in the top six, or potentially a Dennis Mulligan. But Ultimately, I think Robertson is the guy who is most likely to end up with that, especially after the last couple of games and hearing what everybody's saying about him. So I've got Robertson, Kerfoot, and Nylander opening the season as the second line for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I, I can't disagree with that because what's a better combination to really put up there? That's what I mean. It's 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 tough. Like Yarn Croak is a guy who can go up there, I suppose. Also, Mulgan's looked all right with those guys so far through training camp. But ultimately, I mean, Robertson, last three games, last two games, got three points. And you saw the chemistry that he had tonight. I mean, digging for pucks uh, and getting him out in front for Nylander and Kerfoot to cash in on. Pretty solid stuff. Like, when he wasn't putting in the back of the net, he was helping those guys do it. So, I think that uh, today, tonight's game against the, the Montreal Canadiens, I was thinking before he's probably maybe it does have uh, the upper hand on these guys. And then tonight, I think he stole the job. And if he can just continue to build off of the performance over the last couple of games, I think there's no question that he's the the best option in the top six on that second line with these guys. Yeah, I, I just 
I just think that, you know, you also want I, I the Leafs have needed to inject some youth into yeah. this lineup, especially that second line. If Robertson was able to do this last year, I think it would have made a huge difference for that second line. Hell, at least he's doing it now. And let's see if this can continue. And he might he might go through again his ups and downs. So at least the Leafs will have some options to consider, you know, Cal Yarncrook, if if uh, Robertson's on a bit of a slump, bump him up a little bit. If defensively they need things to be shaken up a little bit, they can do that too. But I think having him up there, it just makes too much sense right now. Agreed. Uh, the third line, I I f- subscribe to Sheldon Keefe's uh, ever – lasting love for or his affinity for having like a pure checking line. I, I kind of want that as well. And I think that's what we can get here with this trio of players. I've got Zach Aston Reese making the team, signing a PTO at some point. I would assume it comes rather soon at the, now that they kind of know what's going on. Maybe they wait and, and they sign him after they put uh little good on LTIR after day one of camp. Potentially that's what they're waiting on. But either way, Zach Aston Reese will sign a PTO, uh, sign his contract off as PTO. And then David Camp, clearly he will be this team's third line center. He was terrific in that role a season ago. And this is where Cali Yarncroft really will come in and, and factor in. I think all three of those guys are, are terrific in their own end. And we saw in the game against Ottawa, those guys turned defense into offense, which is something that was successful about the third line last year when it was Engvall, Camp, and Andre Kasha. Potentially, these three can do a lot of this, the same things where they're just so effective in their own end at, at hounding pucks, getting pucks, and then transitioning up ice and maybe end up with a couple of goals. You know, Zach Aston Reese scored tonight. It was a bit of a weird one, but that was it, right? They ended up, you know, transitioning the puck into the offensive end, and all it took was a shot on goal. Bit of a weird one. No one saw it coming. Just came right off the stick and into the back of the net. But hey, if you can do that a couple more times, throughout the season, you know, that's a couple of goals that could definitely help this club. So I like the idea of a checking role. Um, you know, whenever you got defensive zone face-offs, boom, there it goes. Zach Aston Reese, Camp and Yarn Croak, and you feel good about it. I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you got to sign him first. This is true, but yeah, I don't think it's going to take a whole lot to sign him though. Like I, I was having this conversation today on Leafs lunch with, uh, with Mike Johnson from TSN, former NHLer and, you know, he was saying, you know, he doesn't believe it's going to take much either, like roughly around league minimum. Like maybe he only signs for 850000 because if there was a contract out there for a million, a million five, he'd have signed it by now because he's not going to get that in Toronto. He can't get that in Toronto. So, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a, a big contract like some maybe anticipated earlier on in the free agency process. And also – He's he's working so well in Toronto. Does he want to jeopard potentially go to another team? Well, I mean, if they, they offer him, well, if they well, offer him like another half a million bucks, I mean, that might be enough to persuade him, right? It's true, but he's also trying to keep himself not just he he can't just think about this year too. He has to think about future years, and if he goes somewhere else, maybe he gets a little bump in pay, and it doesn't work out, he'll be right where he started all over again, looking for a PTO. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It definitely is something for him to consider. I'm hoping so. In this scenario, I'm projecting it, obviously, because he's in my opening night lineup. So uh, so that's what I got. Aston Reese, Camp, and Yarn Croak as a, a very stout defensive third line. For my fourth line, I've got Nicholas Abe Kubel on the fourth line. I do have Adam Gaudet currently making the team. Um, he, we got to see him yesterday. Didn't flash a whole lot, to be honest with you. But... <sighs> This team's going to penny pinch. He makes 750 k Some of these other guys vying for that fourth line role make more than that. And, you know, even if you only make an extra sixty or 75000 that actually is a lot. And I'll explain why a little bit later once I'm kind of done exactly how much cap space is left with this team and why that matters. But so I've got Goddett as my fourth line center opening night. And then uh, I've got Dennis Mulligan making this club as a, uh, a bit of a speedy right winger on the fourth line. Maybe can provide some pop and some offense, and maybe they can get some tertiary scoring from that fourth line, something they really didn't get really at all last year. 
And, uh, you know, I thought that Mulgan, again, had a decent game tonight. Wasn't as flashy as he had been in the past, but he wasn't playing with the top six players like he was in the first couple of preseason games. But I felt like he did make a couple of decent plays. And, again, someone who could provide just a little spark of offense from that fourth line alongside Goddett and a speedster and someone who's got some physicality like uh, Abe Kubel. So that, to me, is my projected fourth line and my four lines come October 12th, opening night against the Montreal Canadiens. Pretty solid. Not, I, I, there's not a lot that I would change out of that, really. No. So one name that was left off, and it was purposely left off, did you catch it? Oh, God. It was Pierre Engvall. You know what? Yeah, his because it's harder to visualize when you don't have the it in front of you. But yeah, I did. That was kind of one name. I was like, is this because of injury or is this because you're expecting something? I am expecting something, David. I am expecting something. So in order for that group that I just put forward there, along with the defensemen, you know, and we all know the six defensemen that are there, right? Riley Brody, Muzzin Hall, Gio and Sandine, like those combination of six defensemen, along with the two goaltenders, they can't afford to have Pierre Engvall in the lineup. So he's going to have to go, unfortunately. And we knew that there was going to have to be a cap casualty of some kind. For a long time, the the name that was being talked about most was Alex Kerfoot and his $3.5 million cap situation. And then, oh, maybe he can move on from Justin Hall. I think that Pierre Engvall might be the guy who ultimately uh, the Leafs would, would not that they want to move on from him, because I still think that he's a very quality top nine player. I think he's a great, you know, third, fourth line winger who can, um, you know, who, who's a decent four checker. He plays with some speed, he's a smart player. But ultimately, when you brought in Zach Gasson Reese and Yarn Croak and Abe Kubel, you know, those guys can do a lot of similar things to, uh, to Pierre Engvall. But Engvall's making $2.25 million. So if you can get that off the books, that really does open up the cap space necessary to field a 20-man roster and then add one more player at league minimum. If you want to add a guy like, say, uh, anyone making seven fifty, whether it's Jordy Ben, if he's back, or it could end up being uh, you know Victor Mete. Look at that. Now that we're in the city, all I hear is police and, and <laughs> oh, right there. You were, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to ignore it. But. I was trying, I was trying, but it was throwing me off. So I had to bring it up anyways. Um, so yeah, like I ultimately I would, I would hope Pierre Engvall doesn't have to go. Cause I'm a much bigger fan of Engvall than most people. Like I think he's legitimately a top nine player in the NHL. Is he a top six? No, but I think he's a quality top nine guy. And any team would be lucky to have him on their third, fourth line winger. He's got some versatility to him, and he can score a little bit when given the opportunity. We saw that happen last year. You know, he was scoring a little. Like his per 60 numbers, decent production. Um, And he's really good at breaking the puck out too. But ultimately, I feel there's a cap crunch that needs to be made. I don't see them moving on from a, a defenseman like Justin Hall just based on where they're at defensively, especially with the injury to Lilligren. Uh, Alex Kerfoot with the injury to Tavares seems very much off limits at this point, I would think now. Um, and that kind of leaves one guy. A- a- and to me, that's Pierre Engvall, probably the man who ends up getting dealt here, which is why he was left off of my opening night roster. And honestly, like this is not because I don't like Pierre Engvall, but at his price point, and you and you can find a guy that... I don't want to say he's a replaceable player, but totally replaceable because he does bring some things, but he's not a guy that I'm willing to just say we can't move him at all. Like you got to at some point, you can't be married to every player that you have on the team. You have to have some flexibility and the least kind of put themselves in the situation because of their, of the way the cap is and where their cap is. And I, I didn't like the deal because I felt like, Mm, you know what you have other needs and things like that i just i i'm wondering also can they find a, a taker for his deal because it is a two-year deal 
I think, or sorry, is it a no, one-year one year. One year deal? So, one year. you know, you, you can add a sweetener on there. I mean, if if yeah. someone took Nick Ritchie, then uh, I think <laughs> you could find a, a taker for Pierre Engvall's deal. At least Engvall's a, 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 a player who will give you positive, positive plays when he's out there. Although Ritchie ended up doing decent when he was out in Arizona. I'll give him that credit for that. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I think there's got to be a deal made because, like I said, just looking at it now, I'm on cap friendly and I've got this 20 man roster. And when I have Engvall out there after signing Zach Gaston Reese, this is just a 20 man roster, right? This isn't with any extras either, extra skaters to sit up in the press box. So if Engvall stays and Zach Gaston Reese signs for even league minimum 750,000, um, there's six hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars over the cap. So realistically, you're gonna and someone would say, okay, then just send somebody down. Okay, so you're playing with eleven forwards now? Like it's that's the whole situation. You can't just send one to you. if you're sending somebody down to clear the cap to make it work, now you're playing shorthand, right? So the only way to make it work is you know a bit of a cap dump. But unfortunately, I think Pierre Engvall at this point in time, do the injuries to Tavares and Lilligren seems like the most likely option for them to move on from. Not that he's completely expendable, but I think his loss would hurt less than the others. And that's it, right? You're, you're trying to, you're trying, you don't want to move players, but you also think, which is the one we can get rid of. That's not going to have the biggest impact on the lineup. You also have to think of the chemistry, right? You've got things kind of cooking right now with your lines. Do you want to potentially, I wouldn't say ruin it, but do you want to impact that by having to figure out a way to get Pierre Engvall to stay on the team? I don't know if that's something that would make sense for the Leafs personally. So I don't, I don't hate that idea. It's going to, some fans will. I hate it. I, I absolutely hate it. But I, I, don't think hate it. I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't hate it because I, I just, it's just the realities of the situation. that Because you hate Swedish people. Our classmate, Oh no, he was finished. Never mind. I was gonna say our uh, Mark Hughes was one of my favorite boys. Oh no, for, we <laughs> he was that finished season. though. He was finished. Yeah, blonde hair, blue eyes, same thing. I will say, same I was. Oh, I'm a big fan of Swedish fans of Swedish players. Matt Sundin was one of my favorite players growing up. <laughs> I'm Thanks. just playing, buddy. I'm just playing. Um, defensively, though, I've got Riley Brody, Muzzin Hall. Geo Sandine. I think that's how it ends up. I and I hate Muzzin and Hall together as a second pair, just because what we saw last year. But you just know that's what's gonna happen. So this is my projection, not what I would do, but what I project Sheldon Keefe will do. And he tried to go back to this time and time and time again last year. You just know he's gonna start the season off with it again this season and hope that it works out much better than it did a year ago. But I just know it's going to happen come October 12th that those two are going to be trotted out there together in a de- in a defensive zone faceoff. That's that that's worrisome. Like this isn't going to be a perfect roster, right? We're, there's going to be shortcomings, and we already know that there's going to be a point in time where Timothy Lilligan is going to try to get back in there, and just like in the playoffs, Keith is going to trot out Muzzin Hall. It's probably not going to work at some point because I don't know what will change. And it's not like Jake Muzzin is at peak health in terms of his, how he's feeling. That's what concerns me more too. Who's going to be, who's going to be the defensively reliable guy on that line? Well, it's gotta be Muzzin, right? Like it's, it's gotta be, I'll say this though. Justin Hall made a really nice play in the game against Montreal, tying up the stick of, uh, is it Brendan Gallagher? It was either Gallagher or or um, or Dvorak. There was an opportunity for them to to, to basically just tap in a, a, a backdoor goal, and he came in, chopped the stick, and didn't allow them to do so. So he did make a nice defensive play in the game against Montreal. I'll give him that. But uh, yeah, I think you know Justin Hall's got to win. He's got to win people back, right? During the year, the Canadian Division, I think he was. Uh, he was solid, right? Like he had, well, that that duo together, they kind of won over Leafs Brass and, and, and Leafs Nation. Didn't quite go as well last year either. Um, 
maybe this is a new season. Maybe they can go out there and have much better success with a, a, a clean slate. But I just guarantee that they'll be together on opening night. And uh, I think Sandine Geo is actually going to be a fascinating pairing. They didn't get to play at all last year because Sandine got hurt when they got Geo, and then Sandine didn't end up playing at all in the playoffs. So, you know, I think it'll also be really good for him and his long term development just to be able to kind of feed off of Geo for a little bit. So I kind of like that third pair as well. I think it could be extremely successful in in a bit of a sheltered role. And, you know, if you feel like you want to challenge them a little bit and maybe take some hard minutes off of Muzzin and Hall, I think they could also suffice, you know, and with some some D zone situations as well, especially, you know, with Geo being back there. Yeah, that's that's where I think you have to have some balance, right? And you have to. Defensive pairings also have a lot to do with chemistry, and that's probably why Muzzin Hall constantly they go back to that just because they played so much together. But the addition of Geo from last year to now, it gives me more ease that you can kind of put anyone with them, and it seems to work. Like, really, has there been a pairing with Geo that hasn't really worked out well? Like, terribly, I will say. Yeah, not not a whole not particularly. They've all kind of done pretty well with Giordano. Right. So that that's where I'm I'm more at ease if they want to do it like like that. Um it's just it will it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Um and maybe Lily Grin comes back and that rectifies some of the concerns we have. Now, if you want to get real crazy, how about uh Muzzin Riley on Muzzin with Riley on the right, Geo and Brody, and then Sandin and Hall as your third pair. Somebody brought that up as like Riley Muzzin and some and I can't remember who it was that that's like the original pairing that everyone thought was gonna happen. When yeah, Muzzin. when they first brought him back. Yeah, you're right. Never I, happened. I was like that. And then uh <laughs> I'll never forget because it was like a famous Mike Babcock thing where he just like lefty righty. He was course. like it was the right player wrong like wrong. I, I can't remember the exact wording how he put it, and I was like, dude, dude, because if you were left handed, you played on the left side. If you were right handed, you played on the right side. There was no switching back and forth. TJ Brody playing on the right side would n- not really be a thing uh, under Mike Babcock. So, but anyways, uh, actually, technically it was for like a little bit, but he tried to sway away from that as much as possible. He really detested playing guys on their off hands, but uh, Keith, a little more open to it. In fact, it seems like he's challenging some of his guys to do it and, you know, allowing guys like even Riley to try in camp in preseason when it's, you know, a, a time to try these things. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do it in the regular season, but eh, take a couple of shifts, have a couple practices on the right side so that if time comes in a game where you're shorthanded to the point where it's kind of necessary for that to happen, you've got those couple of shifts that you took back in September and October on the opposite side. So that's kind of where we're at right now with the, the Maple Leafs. Uh, and obviously goaltending, I think Matt Murray gets a start on night one. Two reasons. Like Murray gets a start on night one against Montreal. And then I think that Samsonov gets a start in the second game against uh, Washington on the Friday. And then Murray on the second night of a back-to-back on the Saturday will get the revenge start against the Ottawa Senators. So that's how I envision the uh, the goaltending scenario to play out in the next three for the first three games of the year. Love that idea of the revenge game narrative, by the way. For both. You got Washington with Samsonov and then like oh, back to night revenge games. Double dose. Yeah, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be fantastic. So that is my roster projection 1.0 for opening night. We'll see. Technically, Engvall would need to be traded for this to occur. Uh, but we'll see what ends up happening. Uh, with that one, any final comments, Dave? Um, no, it was a solid lineup. Uh, by the way, that game with Montreal got a little chippy, got a little chippy. I'm not gonna yeah, lie, it was, it did. Saw, saw some, uh, some, some 
calling someone calling out Marner for an embellishment. Well, he did take a diving call, didn't he? <laughs> hey, you know what? You don't usually get the calls. I'm just saying he did take a dive, although it was the old trip and dive. It's one or the other. It's like, like it's like on. it's not like no one touched him and he died. He embellished. He didn't really dive. He embellished something that happened to him. Semantics, David. Semantics. Semantics. Hey. One other thing, actually. That power play goal, the first power play goal. Wow, chef's kiss. They get beauty. The way they were zipping that puck around. Oh, tic tac toe. It was spectacular. I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see if they toy when Tavares comes back with him on PP2 and keep bunting on PP1 because that thing looked beautiful. Yeah. We'll see. Oh, yeah. I, 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 it's funny because um, our, um, our counterparts over at uh, Locked On Senators have been very much uh, pumping the Senators' power play on paper. And I'm like, when it does what the Leafs' power play does on the ice, then we could talk about it being one of the top units in the league. Yeah, good call. Good call. Why don't you wait, wait and see what happens in the regular season? Tell me in, in March. Yes. I got one more thing. I brought this up while you were you weren't around. I think. Um, have you looked at our channel subscribers lately? On YouTube, uh, y- yes. We're we're ninety. We're officially ninety two away. Ninety. Am I math right on that? Ninety two away from two thousand subscribers on YouTube. Two K. Two K subs for the locked on Lee's pod. Do you know how much work we did to get two K? Share it up, run the numbers. 2K by opening night. Is that what is that what you're asking for? It's been going like I, I've been I've been like I've been seeing it increase like we got we 20 one day, 30 another. Opening night, if we don't if we don't hit 2K by opening night, I will cry. Is that a week to today? Week tomorrow? Week tomorrow. Week tomorrow. Oh, we could totally yeah. hit that. Come on, guys. You you got I know because we look at the analytics that only like 20% of the people who listen and watch these shows on YouTube are actually subscribed, which means a lot of you guys who watch and listen on a daily basis, or maybe it's your first time, but you're not subscribing, but everyone's coming back to watch. We got a lot of people coming back to watch without subscribing. Subscribe. Help us get to 2000. That'd be greatly appreciated. Share with all your friends and family. The Leaf season's a week away. We want to get to 2,000 subs by next Wednesday. Uh, that will do it for us here today, though, on the pod. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Lockdown Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily lead content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morsuti. Also follow the show at Lockdown Leafs. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. But until then... Keep it locked right here on Lockdown Leaf.